from D. James Kennedy Ministries. This is Kennedy Classics. Hi, I'm Frank Wright, President and CEO of D. James Kennedy Ministries. A few weeks ago, I broke into our programming to tell you about the financial crisis we were facing and to ask for your help. Today, I'm pleased to report that you responded. And thanks to the Lord's blessing and generous donors like you, we were able to make up a good portion of our financial shortfall. That said, there is much left to do. And this year will be one of the most pivotal in our nation's history. So thank you for partnering with us. Please continue to support us prayerfully and financially as we stand for truth, defending your freedom. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. When Albert Einstein published his theories of special and general relativity, the world was both enthralled and mystified by this seemingly new concept. As Sir Isaac Newton's concepts of absolute time and absolute space gave way to the reality that celestial motion and time must be seen as relative to some particular frame of reference, which in itself is also in motion. The implications of Einstein's theories rocked the very foundation of astrophysics. Oddly, some would say inevitably, the idea of relativity began to be spoken of in decidedly non-scientific contexts. We would say, for example, that the value of money, say $100, depends on what your income is. A person earning $50,000 a year would value that $100 bill one way. A person earning $50 million a year would attach a different value to it. In other words, the value of the money is relative to the material well-being of the person rather than having an absolute value. Well, so far so good, but how do we apply relativity to abstract philosophical concepts? such as the value of human life. For example, I value the Hebrews as a historically unique people called out by God as a separate nation designated by God as his own people. Yet, Adolf Hitler did not see it that way, hence the Holocaust. Is that too merely a matter of relativity? And what about the unborn baby in the womb? As you can see, the slope is getting more slippery, and we need a firm place to stand. Well, here to help us with this slippery slope is Dr. D. James Kennedy in a message he delivered at Yale University called Absolutes in a Relativistic Age. I am delighted and honored to be able to be with you this evening at this institution which has such a long and proud history, soon to be celebrating your 300th anniversary, I discover, in just a few more years. How wonderful that is. And of course, I felt uh, quite at home when I was informed that this organization was founded by 10 clergymen who uh, were noted as learned members of the community desiring a school and institution for teaching uh, arts and sciences and propagating the Christian religion. And that, I think, is a wonderful thing. I was also delighted to see that your motto is Lux at Veritas, Light and Truth. And uh, that is basically what I will be addressing you about tonight. 
My subject, as stated, is absolutes in a relativistic age. Dr. Alan Bloom, professor of social thought at the University of Chicago and former professor at Yale University, a school located around here somewhere, I'm told, is the author of a very big book of the past five years, The Closing of the American Mind. And interestingly, in that book, he says, in the very first sentence of the first paragraph of the first chapter, he says this, there is one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of. Almost every student entering the university believes or says he believes that truth is relative. There are no absolutes. Now Mark Twain said, the problem with most people is not what they don't know, but what they know for certain that isn't true. <laughs> and I think that statement applies to this discussion this evening very much. Virtually all of our students in high school have learned that uh, there are no absolutes. You probably heard about the teacher who said to his class, you can know nothing for certain. And one student said, but teacher, are you sure? He said, I'm certain. <clears throat> and if you were to ask a high school graduate how it is that there are no absolutes, how it is that everything is relative and all truth is relative, he will either look at you blankly and not have the faintest idea why that is so, other than that he has been told it is so. Or he may, if he is uh, somewhat uh, more erudite, tell you, haven't you ever heard of Einstein? Where have you been for the past 50 years? Haven't you ever read the theory of relativity? Don't you know that we live in a relativistic universe and that everything is relative? And that settles the matter. Einstein said it, and it must be so. No, he didn't. This is what he said. Relativity applies to the realm of physics, not ethics. Mm. So, how is it that Einstein's theory has been transported into every other discipline and we have ended up in America today with almost a total moral relativism which somehow has been deduced from Einstein's theory of relativity, which has absolutely nothing whatever to do with ethics or with morals. Now, sometimes students don't realize that when a teacher or a professor says there are no absolutes, you need to understand what he is saying. He is also saying there is no God. Because, because, you see, God is the ultimate absolute. He is absolutely supreme. He is absolutely infinite in his power and his wisdom and his knowledge and everything, all of his attributes. God is the ultimate absolute, and what he says is the ultimate and absolute truth. And uh, therefore, 
keep in mind that when anyone says there are no absolutes, they are simply giving you a veiled and cloaked atheism. Not only is it true that when a person says there are no absolutes, are they saying that there is no God, they're also saying that there is no Word of God, that the Scriptures are not the Word of God. Now, the Bible says over and over again, Jesus said of the Word, Thy Word is truth, and that uh, heaven and earth shall pass away, but one jot or one tittle of the law shall in no wise pass away till all be fulfilled. The Bible says that it is truth. It is truth revealed from God. Therefore, it is absolutely true. When God's Word says something, that is the Word of God and that is true. Now, that is not based merely on some predilection on my part or those that believe, but it is based upon evidence. God gives evidence whereby we may know that the Scriptures are indeed the Word of God, evidence which has con convinced uh, hundreds of millions of people over the years. Now, when people say that there are no absolutes, they are also saying that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. Because as God the Son, He Himself is absolute. He is without sin, without imperfection. He was the altogether perfect one. So keep in mind that whenever a person says there are no absolutes, they are saying there is no God, the Bible is not the Word of God, and Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. And I think that we need to see that that is quite a lot of transporting the truths from physics into the realm of religion and morality. Now, with relativistic morals, there also comes subjectivism. And uh, there is no objective standard outside and now today we no longer talk about morals, we talk about values, a term that Nietzsche gave to us. And uh, values are simply anything that anyone chooses to place a value upon. And somehow we have come to the place of believing that every person has some authority to, to decide whatever is good or bad for him, whatever is right or wrong, whatever is of value and what is not of value. And, of course, a corollary of that is that he cannot impose that upon anyone else. You can't impose your values on someone else. That's absolutely true, as long as you're talking about merely values which we have simply accepted. God's law, however, applies to all created beings because he is the creator, and he will apply it to all of them uh, without exception. Another corollary of that is that since our values and mores do not come from God, they must come from some source that influences us, and that is cultural. So these values, these morals are relativistic, they are individual, they are subjective, and they are culturally induced. One person says, we don't live our lives relativistically. If you're waiting in your car at a train crossing and there's a train, huge train coming at 60 miles an hour, you know that if you get your car out in front of that train, you know that you're not going to be relatively dead. <laughs> you're going to be absolutely dead. We can't live by that. And numerous social critics and philosophers and social scientists are saying that it is this view of moral relativism that is absolutely causing the morality of this nation to crumble before our eyes. But over against the moral relativism of our time, I think we need desperately to reassert the fact of what Jesus Christ said. He said, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. 
Now, we are told that we can't know truth, that we can't know anything for certain. Now, granted that science only gives high probabilities, but through revelation, the religion, we can know the truth. The scriptures say these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. I'm happy to say that I know that I have eternal life. I know that should I die today, I will be with Christ forever. I have not always known that. But when I was a young man, about two years after college, I heard the gospel and I came to know that. But I would like to ask you, my friend, do you know that? Do you know for certain that you have eternal life? The scripture says that these things are written that we may know that. Now, sad to say that uh, many people who have rejected the uh, scriptural truth have not done it for the reasons that sometimes people think that they have. For example, Nietzsche rejected uh, the scriptures, he rejected Christianity, he hated religion, and he hated Christianity in particular. And he is, of course, the one who said, God is dead. But you know, the amazing thing is that millions of people believed him. He never proved it, he just asseverated it. It's one thing to declare something, it's another thing to prove it. Somebody wrote upon a building in graffiti, it said, God is dead, Nietzsche. Someone else came along and wrote, Nietzsche is dead, God. <laughs> it's better to debate an issue before settling it, said one philosopher, than settling an issue before debating it. And that's exactly what Nietzsche did. But let me tell you, no one has ever proved that God is dead or that God doesn't exist. In fact, atheism, if you don't know it, is irrational. I wonder how many people are aware of that. To say that there is no God is to assert what in logic is called a universal negative. Now it is well known that no human being can prove any universal negative. You cannot prove that nowhere in the universe are there little green men. You can't prove that. You can't prove that nowhere in the universe is there a being such as God. In order to prove that, you would have to know what is in every part of the entire universe, which is to say, in order to prove that there is no God, you would have to be God. And then you would have proved yourself wrong. <laughs> no, my friends, God is not dead, and that has never been proved. But those who have come to know him have come to know that he's very much alive. And you know, life without meaning, that's the reason so many college students commit suicide today, because life has been robbed of all of its meaning and significance. And if, if all there is at the end is a pile of ashes and a skull, that's just not going to suffice, because the soul is going to peek out around today after tomorrow and desire some assurance of a continuing existence in a better and finer world. God has placed immortality within the heart of men, and we can't get around it. Life cannot be lived without meaning and hope. As a young man, I heard the gospel for the first time in my life. I lived to be 24 without ever knowing it. But I heard of this incredible love of one that loved me so much as to be willing to come down from glory and go to a shameful cross, to hang naked upon that agonizing tree, 
and there to have imputed by his father my guilt upon him and to take in my place the penalty for sin that I condignly deserve to take myself. That he endured, we cannot know, we cannot understand the pains that he had to bear, but I believe it was for us he hung and suffered there. I came to see a love that I had never known before, a person who loved me not because of anything that I was, but in spite of everything that I was, a person who loved me purely and only because of what he was, a God of all grace and a God of love, a God that was willing unconditionally to forgive me of all of my sins and to accept me into his family, to make of me a new person, to create a new heart within me, to clothe me in the robes of his own righteousness and to make me his son and heir eternal and to assure me a place in paradise which he paid for on the cross and ascended to prepare in heaven. And I know this day, this night, that I will be with him. And I have known that for an, a number of decades now and it gets more glorious and more wonderful with every passing year. My life has meaning. I know that I am a child of the king. I am of a royal family. My father is the king of kings and lord of lords. I know that I have been cleansed and given a great and glorious per passion for this world and a purpose for this world, that I should indeed proclaim the glorious glad tidings that God loves sinners and is willing to accept them as they are. If they will repent of their sins and place their trust in the divine Son of God who so loved them and so suffered in their place. And dear friend, I saw that love that night as I was seated alone in my apartment after having lived a very profligate life where God and Christ had no place in my life. And I want you to know that my heart melted before that love and I slipped out of that easy chair onto my knees for the first time in my adult life. And I said, oh God, I didn't know. I didn't know. Forgive me. Forgive me. I didn't see any angels. I heard no angelic choirs, but I stood up from that prayer, a different man. The next morning, while I was shaving, I remember the thought came into my mind, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, declares that I am going to live with him in paradise forever. And a chill went right down my spine. And that, my dear friends, is the greatest absolute I have ever learned. And if you have not experienced it, if you have not claimed it, God invites you to come to him and receive the free gift of everlasting life. May we pray. O God, thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless till they rest in thee. And there are some here tonight, Lord, whose hearts are just that way. They have sought fulfillment, as Augustine did, in learning, in education, in knowledge, but that God-shaped blank within their hearts has not been filled. Lord, I pray that right now you will enable them, as so many have done before, to say, O oh Christ, I surrender my life to you. 
I know I'm a sinner. Underneath all of the pretensions, I know that I have done many things that I am ashamed of. How must you, the all-holy God, look upon them? And yet, amazing to say, you are willing to wash me whiter than snow, to forgive me, to cleanse me, and to accept me as your child now and evermore. And when the stars have burnt into cinders and this universe has collapsed, I will still be with you and will only have just begun to live with you forever. Through Jesus Christ, my Lord and my God, I pray. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer with Dr. Kennedy sincerely from your heart, then we'd like to offer you a special gift. It's the book, Beginning Again, written by Dr. Kennedy for new believers. In these pages, you'll learn how to study the Bible, how to pray, and even how to tell others about Jesus Christ and the decision that you've made today. To receive your copy, just write to the address on your screen or call our toll-free number and be sure to ask for Beginning Again. God bless you as you do. Dr. Kennedy's message is perhaps more timely even now than it was when he delivered it. Our colleges, universities, media, and public institutions have only grown more relativistic in recent years, and yet it only leads to madness. We only have hope in this life through Jesus Christ, who also gives us hope for eternity. If you would like to have this message for your own library or to share it with someone else, perhaps a college student you know who needs to see it, we'd be glad to send you a DVD copy as our thanks for your generous donation of any amount. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11164, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll-free 888-332-3069, or go online to djkm.org. Your generous donation helps us to continue broadcasting powerful gospel messages like this to a world that desperately needs to hear them. I'm Frank Wright. Thanks for joining us on this edition of Kennedy Classics. We are standing for truth and defending your freedom. We'll see you next time. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.